Hi, I'm Michael Fishman. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Michael Fishman, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm really good, thanks. I'm really excited to talk to you and celebrate your entire career. To start with, we're the same age. I grew up watching Roseanne in the 1980s. I think it started when I was about seven years old, and it would be on in the UK on Friday nights, and I used to stay up late and watch it. It was always the highlight of my week. First of all, just thank you for a lifetime of entertainment. Uh, I, it's so humbling, Sarah. Like That's probably the greatest gift, is to get to be in people's homes and, and to be received that way. So thank you for the support. Thank you for, for being part of that journey. So I'm going to go right back to the beginning. Very first episode of Razan. And in the initial pilot episode, DJ was played by Sal Barone. Mm-hmm. And I then researched into it and found out there was a, a Writers Guild strike, as there's just been recently. And between the pilot episode and the second, he had grown quite a lot. He was this eight-year-old kid. And he'd soon be bigger than his sisters, right? So can you tell me how you first heard about the role and auditioned and became a part of the show? Yeah, I'm going to back up just a hair. Um, I had just started auditioning. Uh, My sister wanted to earn money for college and my parents both had normal jobs and had no connection to this business. So they didn't want us to do anything long term. And it was 1988 and the writer's strike was going on. And much like this last strike, there's no work. And... I just gotten an agent and the agent said, hey, you know, there's nothing going on. He'll never get this job because they want somebody with experience. Would you just take him on the audition because he fits the description really well? And we knew nothing. Um, And my parents said, absolutely not. That's a full time job if he ever gets it. And they're like, well, he'll never get it. So my parents are like, "Okay, we'll take him the first one. And uh, it was seven uh, auditions spanning six months. So it was a big process. What we didn't know at the time was they had already shot that pilot, like you mentioned. Yeah. We thought it was for a pilot, which for people who don't know, that's the first episode of of shows to kind of test it out. And in reality, they had already sold it and it was actually for 13. So the second audition I went to, uh, they talked my parents into taking me back kind of against their better judgment. And I met Roseanne and she and I hit it off um, and she pushed for me and I don't know. I, the numbers, I have no idea. It was it was tens of thousands of kids auditioned for that role. By the second or third audition, there was only three of us left. Wow. And the company wanted one, the network wanted one, and she wanted me. And over the span of all those auditions, I ended up winning that role. And it, you know, it was a life-changing experience. Well, first of all, a very, very belated congratulations to you for getting that. <laughs> well, you know, I think things come to you that you're meant to. The other two guys have gone on to have amazing careers too. So, you know, I think everybody ended up where they were supposed to be. Absolutely. And did you ever meet the original DJ? No, uh, we've never had any uh, interaction. You know, that decision was made long before I ever auditioned, right? Probably six to eight months before. So there was never any reason. I didn't know anything about it. You know, I have read like in Roseanne's books or, or in other people's interviews and stuff i know there were some conflicts on set and i know that that his parents didn't love the business and the process and it was kind of his first things but for me this was a beautiful gift um and so there was never any kind of there's no rigid you know a one versus the other kind of thing i think fans sometimes online want to know if there was like a story the story is There was a job available and I auditioned and and started a process. There are so many iconic actors that have been on that show over the years, but can you tell me what John Goodman and Laurie Metcalf have been like to work with? Uh, Phenomenal. I mean, our our entire cast is is really phenomenal. They're incredibly gifted. It's it's a gluttony of, of talent, and I'm literally standing in the middle of legends. I grew up among legends and at the time they weren't i think which was even better because i got to watch them grow and shape themselves and i got to watch the impact that they had on the world around us and after but i got to see them kind of in that pure state as as you're beginning so i got to watch everybody grow i started recollecting the dvds to rewatch them and i'd be watching an episode and i paused it and i was like hang on is that toby Maguire?" And he was probably 12 or something. Yes. And watch these shows Everyone. all the time and don't realize that they're in them. And then you go back and you can recognize people that you otherwise didn't notice. Yeah. And we had such a, I mean, really, we launched a lot of careers. We were the early step for a lot of people and not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. And, you know, if I, 
I'm not a name dropper, but if I if I was going to make a list, my list is about as good as anybody else's because I work with really people that, you know, Toby McGuire and, and, you know, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and George Clooney, like in those early days, we had so many just really talented people. We were welcoming for everyone. You really did. I also interviewed Tom Arnold on my show. I mean, it's very about when he used to work in front of and behind the camera. And afterwards, we were just talking online one night and I asked him who his favorite cameo on the show was. And he said, Bruce Willis. And nobody knew that he was going to be on the show and was just doing the end credit sequence and got into bed with Cruzanne. And the audience went insane, apparently. Yeah. And no one knew that was happening. Uh, he came to visit. He was friends with John. And they kind of snuck him in the bed to surprise everybody. And, you know, those are the kind of things that we did in the time period because we, we were disruptive rule breakers, but in a very um, functional and professional manner. Yeah. So it was a great place to work because, you, you know, you really could push the boundaries. In those days, movies and TV were so separate. And now we kind of, I think we helped break down some of those walls. You really do. And so some of my favorite ever episodes and a time of the year that I now exclusively associate with Roseanne is Halloween. I love those episodes. They were so creative and fun. Did you have a favorite costume? You know, I got it easy on Halloween. Most of my costumes were, were relatively easy, especially in comparison to what other people had to wear. That first one called Boo, where I opened the door and I'm like the impaled ninja was a pretty great costume. Yeah. And then I would tell you, you know, from a from a personal standpoint and an experiential and doing a show, the next one where I, I play the witch, right? Or the mm -hmm. warlock. And there's all these questions about, you know, at that time, you know, is he is he dressing in a feminine outfit? Is like these were big social constructs that we're still battling with now. Yeah. And we were so far ahead. It was such a beautiful opportunity. It really was. You also played the alfalfa nature. Yes. That was a really yeah. funny episode. When you, we did things like that work, you know, he wants to be the Terminator and they want him to be alfalfa. And then we combine the two to kind of, which is what you do with kids, right? You try yeah. and find that middle ground. Can you tell me what it was like at the time? You're just a small kid, but you're starring in the biggest show on TV. What was it like growing up and being well-known when you're still at school and trying to find your way through the world and learn things yourself? Yeah, you, you know, I, I think for me, I never had any anonymity, right? I never had a private life per se. All of my memories really are public. I mean, we literally, our audience was so huge. And when we're talking about 24 to 30 million people we're talking about numbers for like huge events or super bowls now and that was a weekly occurrence so there was yeah. nowhere you could go where people didn't know you but it also it, it comes with responsibility and it comes with requirements but at the same time you know i always looked at it as a blessing and i've always kind of embraced it and said okay this is a responsibility. I, I'm going to make the most of it and I'm going to have a voice Then I'm going to try and use my voice well. Looking back on that original series, have you got any favorite scenes or moments from the production that are really special to you or stood out as being funnier than the rest? Oh, I mean, I, I, I have scenes from every season. I mean, I, I have so many episodes. You know, I, you know, I can go season by season. I think I have one time on my Facebook somewhere in an old post and I probably should return to that because now I have so much more perspective. Mm. Uh, I would say like an episode like Lover's Lanes early on. I want to say it's like the fourth or fifth episode. I think it's the beginning of when you really see Roseanne's writing when they're going to make fun of Becky at the bowling alley and they're going to tease her. Um, you know, when the girls got their period, that was such a huge conversation and such a fight to put on the air. Yeah. It was a fight to do Halloween because Halloween hadn't really been done on television before. And it was it was a huge battle. And credit to Roseanne because when they originally did it, you know, everyone said, we're not going to put it on the air. And she goes, well, then just don't, but we're, we're doing it. So we fought for things. Um, you know, we had the lesbian kiss episode with Meryl Hemingway, which was so impactful. Um, I got to watch George Clooney kind of launch his career and he had some great moments as a character. For me personally, I would say things like, you know, um, probably being bullied and paying off uh, Maxine with with uh, Twinkies was a huge one. Um, when when CJ is a peeping Tom to the next door neighbor, and then there's a masturbation episode called Homeward Bound, which at the time was you know we did a lot of episodes that were hard. Yeah, that's one of those ones where it was so funny. You have to just kind of be fearless and embrace it. And then maybe the most socially relevant. Yeah, 
one I wish we would kind of dive into again is uh, White Men Can't Kiss, which is the one where DJ doesn't want to kiss the girl in the play, right. who ultimately, in the Connors, he ends up marrying and, and turns out to be the woman who he falls in love with and, and is the mother of his child. And like that story, I almost think now is maybe even more valuable than it was then because that's what communities and families look like now. It was a really funny comedy, but it also it was real and it tackled important subjects. Do you think that's partly why it still resonates with people and is still so beloved all these years later? Yeah, I, I, you have to realize that comedy can be kind of timeless if it's done well, but it has to be kind of based in some form of reality because these are topics that people are still dealing with. And I think that's the beauty of the show, the power of what we made. A lot of that is Roseanne's influence and the way she pushed for things. This is the nature of what the show was. And it's it's really, it shaped what I want to build and the kind of stuff that I write and the kind of stuff that I strive for yeah. as a person in this business. Because for me, it's not enough to be funny, right? Like my expectations maybe are unrealistic, but you know, I, I come to this from a ground of that's where I grew up. So that's my baseline. Mm. Yeah, it's really important. And you become more invested in the characters and what they're going through and their, not just their triumphs, but their struggles and these difficult moments. And also just how you can use comedy to help lift them and get yourself through those things. Yeah, comedy, you know, I think anybody who's ever been through anything traumatic in their life realizes if you can't find a way to laugh, it's going to be very difficult for you to progress. And and truthfully, for characters who are really smart is usually it's not funny to the person experiencing it. Right. But for the rest of the world, it can be funny. And then to find the humor and find the love within the framework of what's going on. And we all get tested in life. Life is not easy. And that's one of those things that is universal. So I think if you lean into that, there's a lot of great topics that come if you're just not a, if you're afraid to run into those things, you run away and you kind of spin your wheels. But if you're willing to lean into it, the hard, the ugly, the true, that's where the best stuff comes from and the best comedy comes from. Yeah, I completely agree. I've always tried to use humor to get through difficult situations. And I worked at a company once where they were making everybody redundant. I knew they were going to make me redundant. It was fine. I was over it. It wasn't a problem. But I started to feel really bad for these two people that were going around having to tell everyone one by one that their life was kind of ruined in that moment. And so I just wanted to make them laugh. And by the end of it, they said it was the funniest redundancy they'd ever had. And that was important to me. Well, there's something about being the person who wants to bring peace to others, right? Yeah. Like if you can find humor in it, like that's a terrible situation, right? <laughs> but there's a part of you where it's like, if you can step back and you can go, this is really dumb, right? Like, and, and, and the way about like, I don't have to be, I don't have to be aggressive or combative in this moment. If I step back and have a better perspective, I can really realize Hey, there's humor here if I can find it. I think so. It wasn't like anything I was going to say could change it. So the best I could do was steer things towards the best interaction that I could have with these people. And I'm quite irresponsible anyway, so it was fine. Uh, <laughs> sounds pretty wise to me. Sounds um, sounds like you have the right grounded soul and you, you get the concept that things are bigger than just the moment. Yeah, I have the opinion that, okay, I'm now going in this direction. Exciting. What am I going to do next? I'm just ready for my next challenge or creating that next opportunity. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it too. I mean, I, I feel like people get bogged down in the moments. Like we all have to make adjustments. Life is about change and, and things are changing all the time, whether we realize it or not. So the things that are meant to happen will happen and you'll find your way. Sometimes it's not what happens, but how you react to it that can ruin or just get you through the next day, right? I think it's everything. I think how we react to things, you're going to be, like I said, you're going to be tested in life. Things are going to happen that you don't want. There are going to be tough moments. It doesn't matter how great your life is. You're going to lose people you love, right? Yeah. And that is a reality of living. And so part of it is you have to embrace the living part of it. And, you know, our perspective on things shapes most of what we experience. It really does. So I want to go back to Roseanne towards the end of it. So season nine, I felt had a different vibe to the rest of the show. So at the end of season eight, Dan had had a heart attack. Then we find out that he'd been cheating on Roseanne. They win the lottery. Then in the end of it, you kind of find out it was all just part of a book. And Dan hadn't had an affair, but he died. Looking back, what did you think on that season and everything that happened in it? Well, I'm going to back up just a step. At the end of season eight, we didn't know if we were coming back. 
All right, and okay. A lot of talk, um, whether we were going to come back or not. So that was a rough off season. Uh, yeah. Probably one of the roughest I ever experienced because I realized I hadn't told everybody how much they meant to me. So I kind of came back on season nine with the mindset that I was going to tell everybody how important they were and make sure I didn't leave anything unsaid. And then, you know, we, we kind of had a mission for season nine and Roseanne had a plan and there was a promise from production. You know, Tom Warner had promised that we could take everybody in production and we would take a trip and we'd do some of those things that other shows had done. And they, yeah. they kind of said no to all that. <laughs> and um, she, in a very bold way, said, hey, wait a minute, you know, then I'm going to do what I want to do here. And then all of a sudden we won the lottery and and there's a lot of really interesting um social constructs i would say in that sense i know people have debates uh, as to how much they like it don't like it this that or the other that's open for interpretation and that's the power of someone who has creative control and they get to use it the way they want but you know that train episode right we we basically the train gets taken over by the taliban that's 1997 that's so far before any of the stuff that that we see in the 2000s and and later that lead to a war you know, we had all these things about oppressing women's voices. We had all these kind of things about rich and poor and, and these changes. There are some really good constructs within that season. I think that there are messages there that I think are really valuable. And Roseanne was bold and she was always bold. And at the end of that, you know, there was actually talk of doing a spinoff and talk of doing other stuff, her and I. And, you know, the way we ended it, kind of our initial, there was an initial ending that got adjusted because mm-hmm. it kind of got leaked to the world. And at the end, it was only three people in the studio. They cleared the studio and only three people knew the ending. So we literally had to watch on television to see, to find out that it was written and it was a book and all that stuff. Like we had to watch at home like everybody else. So yeah. it was a bit of a shock. Yeah. I think if I had a show, I'd definitely write into it that we were going to go to Hawaii. I think that's a good plan. <laughs> well, and she did something that's really brilliant. Uh, and no one's ever really given her credit. I've said it a few times, but we shifted. We had been a a largely the production, the crew portion had been non-union and we shifted to union so that all those people would have jobs going forward. And that was a big, that was a big push and a big step that really kind of propelled a lot of people into stability. Must've made such a huge impact for a lot of people. Yeah. It changed people's lives. Definitely. Can you tell me, did you ever get the opportunity to keep any props or souvenirs or costumes from the show? Yeah, I have stuff. Uh, I snuck I, I stuff away as we were ending. I tried to like hold on to whatever they would let me. Um, <laughs> so I have, there's three of them. Roseanne has one and I have one. And then mm. one of them actually got destroyed. Um, the Godzilla's from the counter in the, yeah. in the living room. Um I have a bunch of the toys from DJ's bedroom. I have a couple of the old like items, a, a couple of costumes, a couple of things from the show. I And then a bunch of behind the scenes stuff, stuff that wouldn't make sense to anybody else, um, including like the, I had a parking space that had my name on it. Right. And last year they had started doing construction, but they weren't, they weren't willing to fix our studio until all, until we were gone. But they came through and like accidentally tore up the, the nameplate. So I have this mangled nameplate, but it kind of has this meaning for me from the standpoint of it's kind of bent and shifted and kind of crushed, but still, still good, still made it through. And kind of that was kind of a message for kind of that last year and at the end. I always wondered if someone had the original sofa in their bedroom or something. And <laughs> Well, the sofa originally went to the Smithsonian mm-hmm. and, and then it was it's owned by a private collector. When we started to do the new show. And, or when we came back as Roseanne, they, they wouldn't let us use it unless they had like 24 hour security and like all this is like, it became so insane. There was no way that we could have afforded to even use our own couch. So it's <laughs> such a weird thing. So we basically found something very similar. It was in good hands for over a decade, right? Yeah. And, it, you know, I don't know what that thing smelled like because people put stuff in it. Like we, we weren't kind to it because in the beginning, you don't know what kind of longevity you're going to have. So sometimes people do some funny things. And then a few years later, then it becomes a running joke inside the show. And then, you know, you get 10 years in and then you, all of a sudden it goes to a museum for 10 years. You know, I went to the Smithsonian and that's the couch I used to lay on. And people used to throw trash and food in it sometimes. <laughs> or like, there's a bunch of scripts that used to be in it. 
And it's never been cleaned. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I feel like it would increase its value if it was brought back for the new show, right? Yeah, I agree. But, yeah. you know, sometimes we don't get, you know, people make their own decisions about that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, we'll find another way. Maybe just because it's been about three decades, they didn't want any more food added to the situation. <laughs> could be, could be. that Maybe they didn't trust what we might do to it. <laughs> it's just a hygiene thing. You also guest starred in an episode of Seinfeld in about 1997, I think. You were queuing up in line in Baskin Robbins and never got served. Can you tell me what your favorite ice cream is? Oh, uh, probably mint and chip. Mint chip? Uh, yeah, and that I think I order a triple minute man mint. So kind of, kind of close to the same mm-hmm. thing. Um, yeah, I, Seinfeld was a beautiful opportunity. We had been kind of rivals in the early days and then to get to go over there and watch how all of them worked and the way they yeah. built that show it was awesome. Yeah, it must have been so much fun. I remember watching the episode and I was just like, there's Michael Fishman. I to work with James Spader too in that, on yeah. top of getting to work with Jason Alexander. And then, you know, 20 something years later, I get to direct Jason Alexander when he's on the Connors. And, you know, it's a full circle moment again. Yeah, it really is. You also starred in Walker, Texas Ranger. You voiced characters in Little Rosie and Hey Arnold. Are there any other shows that you'd love to be a part of? Oh, I mean, there's so many things I'd love to be a part of. Um, Anything in that John Wick world now as an adult, like as a guy who's pretty active and has some military and um, tactical training, uh, anything in the action realm, um, any kind of Western, anything that has to do with baseball, anything that has to do with sports. I mean, there's, you know, I never to this to this point up until now, I haven't really got to play a police officer or anybody in the military or a doctor. And all three of those I have experience around them significant experience so i'm like those are just kind of a matter of time i think so the right opportunities are coming so really you need a western action film set at a baseball stadium with a bunch of army people in it right <laughs> could, could be you know if you're going to do them all at once yeah I'm, yeah I'm down for pretty much anything i don't think people realize just how uh i probably lean more towards drama now than i do towards mm. comedy although i love doing comedy it's just my life experience is that way, but I also have a lot of you know, a lot of unique skills that, that kind of benefit me and a lot of stuff for a stunt environment that works well. It's great being so well-rounded as an actor, not just that, but in front and behind the camera as well. You just understand the entire production process because you've been around it your entire life. Yeah, and I've worked in almost every department with the exception of hair and makeup and wardrobe, <laughs> and I would butcher both of those. So it was probably for everybody's best interest, but I've been an electrician and I've worked in a grip and, you know, I, I, I was a production design person. I built sets. I was a prop guy, a set dresser. I did a little bit of everything, been a camera operator as well as a director. So as a director, when I ask people to do stuff, I know what it takes to get it done. And yeah. I, it gives me better perspective. You also played a teen in Steven Spielberg's Artificial Intelligence. Did you get to meet the director? Oh, yeah. I mean, we spent a couple of days. I mean, the moment in the film, uh, Adrian Grenier is, is in that scene, you know, Haley Joe Osmond and, and, you know, Jude Law. But that movie was so big because it was Stanley Kubrick's last film that he had passed away. So there was all this secrecy around it. And it was during the uh, Bush Gore election. So there was a lot of chaos. Oh, yeah. But it was such a beautiful opportunity. I have such admiration for Steven Spielberg. I would love to just sit down with him again and have deep conversations because I have so many I, I have better questions now I had questions then but I have better <laughs> questions now as a more experienced person yeah there's always times where you look back and go oh why didn't I ask them that yeah or, or I should have asked this question or you know sometimes you don't know what you don't know at the time and, and what I will tell you is my goal my goal is to work with him again before it's all said and done before he's I, done I'm gonna retire long after him <laughs> I believe it's going to happen. I mean, you're going to be in that baseball stadium together with your cowboy hat on, police badge. Uh, listen, you speak it into existence. I'm down for pretty much any role at this point. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to tag just everyone in a tweet, and I'm sure we can get this happening. Please, please, because yeah. I love to work. <laughs> I'm going to do it straight after this interview. So okay. excited for it. Yeah, I, I, I'm in. And I suggest it being a musical as well, because we don't get enough musicals. Just an action Ooh. Western baseball musical. Now, I might have to draw the line there. The one thing you don't want to hear is me, me singing. I'm the one <laughs> actor that like, you know, they say anybody can really carry a tune. I would beg to differ. I'm one of those people, who, you know, <laughs> say some people need a bucket. I would need like a backhoe, a dump truck and a whole choir behind me to help balance me out. because that, that is not my strong suit. Oh, we're going to make that happen. There's going to be a whole choir there. It's going to be spectacular. 
<laughs> okay. So you continued working with Roseanne at Full Moon High Tide Productions. What was that experience like? That was obviously when you were doing more behind the scenes stuff, right? Yeah, you know, when I became a dad, I kind of moved behind the scenes. But yeah. one of the things that kind of was universal was whenever she had projects, especially when they couldn't get stuff done, um, when they struggled to find somebody who could come in, it's one of the things is I was always able to kind of fill that gap and help her get things done. So I was either the guy they called when they couldn't fix or find something. So I built mm-hmm. a lot of sets for her. I created a lot of content, uh, worked a lot of different areas of the crew to make things possible for her. But then also, I was one of those sounding boards where I was somebody who could stand and tell her the truth and give her an honest opinion and give her kind of a, a candid look where people may not always, you know, people are protecting their job. In my case, I cared more about the outcome of the production and making the production good, which sometimes meant disagree. And, you know, people are afraid to disagree, but you can't get great work if you're not willing to battle over some of it. Yeah, I disagree. I'm you just... can. You're allowed. <laughs> you know, I think that's part of it is how we disagree, right? Yeah. Because just because you, there should be some battle over it, but it should be done with compassion and respect and, and there should be a professionalism that goes with it. But let's let's go after what's great and let's not settle for average. So you disagree all you want. I, I welcome it. <laughs> I only did it to be funny. I don't mean I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you can. Like I said, I'll welcome either side. I I. I stand in. I'm going to own my opinion. So we're good. (laughs) Love that. So in 2012, Comedy Central hosted a roast of Roseanne Barr. You attended it. Can you tell me, though, who would you like to roast or who would you like to be roasted by? Who would I like to roast? Um, You know, roasting is not exactly my thing. Maybe in private. I'm not (laughs) public roast people kind of people. I think people get enough hate. There's enough trolls in the world. Yeah. but I would love to get roasted by, you know, I like any great comedian, you know, I listen, Roseanne can roast me anytime she wants, you know, that might be fun. Um, I would say, God, there's so many great comedians. I, I don't even want to limit it. I would just love somebody like, like I said, I welcome the challenge. So, you know, feel free to come at me because it means I get my chance to come back. <laughs> I love that. Roseanne ran from 1988 to 1997. How did you react when you first heard that the show was going to be revived for a 10th season? Were you initially excited or reluctant to return to the role? Well, I actually thought it would take longer. I know that sounds funny, but Roseanne and I had worked together so much through the years. We had shared ideas, so I kind of knew where this was all going to kind of head. Yeah. But I thought it would take longer. And then it all happened so, like, just unbelievably fast. But the way it was supposed to, um, there is some, I wouldn't say trepidation, but there's a risk. I mean, you are kind of typecast a little and people are used to you being in a certain role. But that group of people is so great. I was willing to sign on and I felt like we had so much more to tell. And Mm. when you tell stories, like we talked about earlier, when you tell comedy with integrity and real issues, that's such a rare combination that we don't get enough of. You can't help but want to sign up for more of that. The show, again, was a huge success and was commissioned for an 11th season. But then obviously some events happened online regarding Roseanne and the show was initially cancelled. And then I think about a month later, it was uncancelled. That must have been such a conflicting, stressful, difficult time for you. It was a pretty devastating time. Um, So so what happened is the actual Roseanne show got cancelled. And not only did it get canceled, but all the reruns were pulled, everything was pulled, and kind of the legacy disappeared. And then conversations started to happen about doing the Connors. And I really initially said no, because my response was, you know, I had a lot of loyalty to her, and I just didn't feel right about moving on until she started coming out and making public statements that she wanted the show to continue. Yeah. Um, And she owns a piece of the show. You know, she's compensated for every episode. So she's always been a part of things. Yeah. For me, part of that was I felt a pull for the audience. Um, I really felt like we owed our audience who had gone through all of this with us and who had stood with us through that. And once she signed off, then the next step for me was like, okay, then this is how we keep this legacy going and how we repair. And I thought it was really important that we repair and that we stand in strong and create a space for the people who 
had loved our show and supported mm -hmm. us for so long who suddenly lost this portion of, of their comfort in their life because I know what it meant to people. Even for me as a fan, I was really surprised when it was cancelled and then relieved when it came back. And I was curious to know how it would come back. It took quite a while for it to come over to the UK. It's all available now so people can watch it on Sky Comedy. Can you tell me how your portrayal of DJ changed over the years? Obviously, you are really young to start with in Roseanne, but then growing up and being an adult in the Connors. Well, over the course of the first run, DJ was a really interesting character. He's kind of the straight face, but did very strange things. So I got to be the straight man at times, and I got to be wacky at times, which is a beautiful thing to get to play. He also dove into really deep topics, and I think that was an incredible blessing because it grew me not just as a, a, a performer, but as a person. Then, you know, you get a 20-year gap in there, you grow a lot as an individual. And I got this beautiful gift of coming back, being a veteran. And we started talking about PTSD, which I think is a huge topic. It's something that is in a number of the projects I'm building because we didn't get to talk about it enough. And yeah. for me, that, that's something that I'm very passionate about being from a military family. And then, you know, being in an interracial marriage, having a biracial child. These, I think, are topics that are, one, they're pervasive throughout society, but they're not as common on screen as they yeah. are off. And so for me, I wanted all of it. You know, I, I dove into all of it and I, those were my goals. And I, you know, I'm sad that we didn't get as far into those things as I would have liked. But again, it means that there's other places for me to do so. Absolutely. And I think representation on screen is so important for so many marginalized communities and people going through stuff that aren't in the public conversation, just get ignored or looked over. And I just think it's really important that you're taking these things and bring them up to actually talk about them rather than have people feel like they can't. So even if the first conversation is just about an episode of the show, that's a really good starting point. They are. And it's so important because... We need productions that look like the world we live in, and we need to see on-screen representation. And that's not just, you know, that's not just groups that I fit in, but also, you know, whether it be the LGBTQAI community, the trans community, you know, but also people who are dealing with chronic disease, people who are yeah. dealing with caretaking, um, people with mobility issues. You know, we, we talk, you know, there's a number of people in, in these episodes if you look at the episodes I directed, I was really specific about what the background looked like in yeah. some of those scenes. And you'll see that, you know, I, I read some of the studies, you know, there's studies released every couple of years about, you know, how we're doing an in inclusion in our business. And I was really disappointed, you know, such low representation for Native Americans, such low representation for people with mobility issues, particularly people in wheelchairs, right? And, and in the mm -hmm. background of things, particularly, you know, diverse groups and mixed backgrounds, right? Like not checking boxes, but right. we are such a, we're all such a hodgepodge of, of different cultures and, and backgrounds. The people that you see in production should look like that too. And, you know, and then it comes to starting to tell stories from different narratives and different perspectives. I know people get worried that you're like going to force things down people's throat. We're not forcing things. The thing is, you want stories that are reflective of the world you live in mm -hmm. and where everyone can see themselves. Because if you've never seen yourself in a show, you don't understand what that impact is for people when they first do. And that is a cultural moment. It is a psychological moment. It is a welcoming kind of, kind of safety moment, but it also is this beautiful awareness of I'm included in the world around me and media. And that's an important part of what we do. The world is a melting pot full of amazing people from diverse cultures and backgrounds, and we should celebrate that. And I just think it makes everything more interesting, more real, and just connects the world in a much better way. I agree. And, I, you know, people miss in my background, I'm the son of an immigrant. Like I have a very kind of American story, right? Like my dad immigrated here. He was born in China and then grew up in Israel and then came to the United States. My mom's from a really small rural area in Virginia, mm -hmm. born in a house with no running water and no electricity. Like then I get to work in television. Like I get to make art as a job. Like this is such a beautiful blessing. So I, I might be more conscious of it because mm -hmm. I'm so far from the origin of where my family came from. 
But I also think it's really interesting is good stories are universal, right? The story of, of overcoming things, what most people want in the world is shared. So I think some people get a little sensitive about what people look like. Mm. Maybe maybe you should take a flip on that and realize that maybe we weren't sensitive enough, enough before and that that inclusion is going to empower not just their story, but your story and every other story. And that's the goal. Yeah, it's so important. And just thank you for having that conversation. And that's why I love doing my show, because I can just shine a spotlight on lots of different people doing incredible, amazing, inspiring work. And, you know, I'll talk about the biggest films in the world, but I'll also talk about a first time director or an author who's just released their first book. I interviewed somebody who had never done an interview before. And that was literally her first one and her book did really super well. And she's just released her second one. And now Amazon's literally today listed it as one of the best books of the year. So I love stuff like that. Yeah. And we all have to start somewhere. I think that's the other part is like, I think sometimes people are so worried that they're going to lose something that, that they, they block others. And the reality is you don't gain a blessing by blocking somebody else's. Mm -hmm. The more you help people, the more that your blessing will shine and will grow. And I, I think you get that. And it's part of the beauty of what we do when we do this business right. 100% agree with you. So you mentioned, of course, you've directed several episodes of The Connors. How were the, the cast and crew receptive of you? And was there something that when you went back into that new series that you're hoping to be able to do more of? Yeah, you know, it was, it was a goal coming back. Um, for me, coming back, all those years later, I had a very clear outline of things I wanted to do, things I wanted to achieve. You know, I've been writing and, and creating stuff. So I contributed a lot of ideas and, and pitched a lot of stuff. But also I wanted to direct. I wanted to expand that part of my career. And then also for me, being a narrative, right? Like sharing perspectives that hadn't been. And also there's a level of professionalism that I wanted to uphold and, and an interaction. You know, I think Sets sometimes can be hierarchical. We hear mm. some of the horror stories of people not treating people well. I've always had a different perspective on that. You know, I loved our crew from the very beginning. So it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, the executive at the top who owns this show or you're the PA at the bottom. I know everybody's names. It's my job to kind of have a concept of who everybody is and to engage them as respected coworkers. Mm. I have a perspective that, you know, I what we do kind of lives on forever. So our names are kind of linked forever. And I want to make sure that people will remember how you made them feel. And so it's important to me that I, I treat people right in that sense. Down to, you know, when an audience member comes to watch our show, I make a point of staying after and shaking people's hands and meeting people because I want them to have an experience because that audience is part of the experience of that episode. Yeah. And I, I listen to everybody through all those years in between of how much this show meant to people. Like you were talking before, Sarah. And for me, I would have never known it was on Friday nights over there in the UK, right? But now I listen to what that meant to you. Yeah. For me, I want that to be an experience when you come. And I want you to understand that I value the fact that you supported that show. I value the fact that you, you cared enough and that you shared your, your space and your time with us, that you trusted us to be in your home. So I think we have a bigger responsibility. That's just kind of my perspective on it. And so I really tried to embrace that coming in. And I have so much, so much I want to kind of build and share. Mm. So part of it was too, is learning from everybody as much as I'd already worked in all these other departments is I'm always on the search for new information and new things and learning new ways. I think that's the best way to approach life. And incidentally, that's come across in everything I've researched about you. Everyone always says you're the nicest person on set. Oh, hold on. Uh, I, I, think, I don't want to be the nicest. Uh, nice <laughs> is an adjective that I think people sometimes can use against you. Um, well, I certainly I, wasn't trying to roast you. When I no, said. no, 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 no. I know. I know you were giving <laughs> me a compliment. <laughs> yeah. I, I always tell people I try to be the kindest. Right. Kindness is a choice. Right. And, and so I know how to be strong. Um, I'm this kind because I, I know what cruel looks like. I know what unfair looks like. And I, I, I've i never been okay. So I've always been the guy who quietly speaks up. So I make a point of like, yeah, I hear all the time people go, oh, you're the nicest guy. It's like, okay, hold on. I don't want to just be nice yeah. because I think people dismiss nice. I want to be 
driven and focused and kind by choice. So people understand that there's a choice here and that I'm making that choice because I hope it encourages other people to make that choice, if that makes sense. And that's why you're so nice. <laughs> fair, fair enough. You win. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Well played. Thank you. So I want to talk about a new cast member in the Connors. Katie Seagal came in and there was obviously a big hole when Roseanne left and she was brought in as Dan's new love interest. And I've just got to say it's such perfect casting because obviously she was Peggy Bundy and married with children. But I can think of another person on the planet that could even come close, you know. Was that show seen as like a rival show? I suppose it must have been in the 1990s, right? Yeah, in some ways. I, you know, a lot of that stuff, I think that's more fan based than it is for us. We're all just trying to do great work and, and get our things in and, and focus on what we're building. Katie's so special. Mm. Uh, it's such a beautiful blessing. Again, when we talk about people you get to work with, to get to direct Katie, because she's, uh, I don't even want to say like, she's so professional. Like, you could almost say she's like a machine, like, you just can't miss. But I, that almost, doesn't give her enough of a compliment and enough respect like she's just so good again i got another legend right like every time we have an opening it's like a new legend shows up yeah. and steps in and and listen no one is ever going to replace roseanne and we knew that and and everybody knows that but katie is katie and that is such a unique gift to get to come to set and get to share a set with her and she's such a beautiful human being mm. Yeah, I completely agree. So that wasn't even a question. It was just more of a comment that I've wanted to say out loud since I saw her yeah. be cast in the show. I just thought it was such a great choice. She's brilliant. Uh, yeah. We've had so many brilliant people. And, you know, like I said, it is this incredible, like, you get Jason Alexander as a guest. He just comes in to play this priest and and just is heartfelt and hits a home run. Like, every time you turn around, there's like, hey, there's another legend over there. Like, it's hard to believe all the people I've gotten to work with, but it's been an incredible blessing to learn from them all. Yeah, it must have been such an incredible learning experience all the way through it. I like doing interviews chronologically, but I'm now going to go back to season six for a very specific reason. So in season six, Jackie and Fred had a baby, Andy. Then in season eight, Roseanne had her fourth child, Jerry Garcia Connor. In the revival, it's revealed that he's now on a fishing boat and kind of isn't mentioned again. Do you think it'd be interesting for those characters to come back? Do you think it might confuse people that don't remember those episodes or what do you think would happen? Uh, well, listen, our audience is so um, just absolutely devoted to us. Mm -hmm. I think they don't miss anything. So they give us leeway and they've supported us no matter what. I, I think it's either way. It's, it became what the executives on the show wanted. They chose to go away from both of those characters and they chose to kind of not use that part. Again, if they choose to use those characters at any time, they're brilliant enough that they can really come up with amazing storylines. We have the ability to kind of go any way we want. Those are interesting characters. They're interesting storylines. I do understand. Mm. I think there were, they felt like there were too many kids and too many people to service. Mm. And, and ultimately, you know, my character ended up kind of also not really being included going forward. And that, you know, there just wasn't enough time. So I think there's always people we could include. And I think there's no there's no perfect way, right? People are always going to want certain things. And, you know, you, you take it as it comes. It's fun to have those characters out there as potential storylines in the future as well. And so you didn't return for season five. Was the door left open for a return in the future? Is that something you'd still like to do if given the opportunity? Well, I've always been open. I mean, I, I love this show. I love the people on it. You know, um, I never fought over money or fought over, you know, any of the incidental stuff in the back. I, for me, it was about doing great work and it was about growing. And so, you know, the character just kind of slowly kind of blended into the background and so they kind of moved away from it like i said i think dj has some of the most compelling stories that you could possibly tell i mean yeah. this is a military member his wife's in the military and military stories I, we don't see enough in television and then you add in he's in an interracial marriage which is a huge topic that we never really got to cover and then he has a biracial child mm. so for me coming from a diverse family with a really diverse background you know, and you can see my kids behind me, like for me, it's personal. Yeah. yeah. And so I would love to tell those stories and I would love the opportunity. Again, it has to be the right opportunity. And, you know, mm -hmm. again, they have to want to tell those stories and, and that's their choice. Right. So 
you just kind of, if you're ready, you're ready. And so the last we heard of DJ, he's joined his wife, Gina, overseas. Have they ever pitched you a spinoff with DJ in a brand new location, brand new setting and all that good stuff? Would you consider that? Well, I think, I think we absolutely could have done a spinoff. I think we still could. I, you know, those stories, especially for me with the background I have in my personal life, I'm compelled by those stories, but also I have so much to pull from, you know, very much like Roseanne, when she first started the original show, she pulled so much of her real life and her real yeah. experience. I could very easily tell a story about an interracial family, having biracial children, having a mixed family, you know, military storylines that, you know, I've grown up with my whole life, PTSD, what it's like to try and kind of build as a family. There's not enough good shows that can do real topics plus comedy at the same time. And I feel uniquely positioned for that. And I feel like, you know, look, DJ Connor has 30 years of an incredible history that the world knows. Mm. So there's a huge opportunity there. If they wanted to go mm. down that road, I feel like we have really powerful stuff. Some of the most compelling stuff and probably the most um, interactive for our audience and, and unique uh, things that haven't been covered and haven't been tackled. And we could do them. The blessing of what we have is 30 years of trust and history with our people. We can say things that other people can't say that people aren't ready for, but that we can because we yeah. built that kind of connection with our audience and connection with the world. So listen, I got a million ideas. It would be such an honor. I, I would sign up in a heartbeat. I'd very much love to see that happen. You will. Maybe, maybe the fans and, and the audience, if, if there's enough support for it, maybe that'll happen. Okay. I'm going to have to send two tweets after this. We're going to get the <laughs> Cowboy Baseball musical and this. Okay. Well, if I get a choice between the two, maybe the second one, because I, 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 there's a lot there that's left unsaid and untackled and you know, I love to work every day and I love to be on a sitcom set and it would be a beauty to get to have all those legends come and be part of this show. Oh yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, incredible. It's so great. So can you tell me, are you still in regular contact with anyone from the show and who would you say you're closest to? Well, I communicate with people all the time. You know, I, I, I did that after the original show. I never really lost connection with everybody. I've tried really hard to kind of keep the doors open, keep the communication going. So it made it really easy for me when we came back to set. And it, it actually benefited me later that it wasn't my mission, but it made it easy as a director because I kind of had a perspective on how people worked mm. in a unique way. So, you know, trying to stay connected to everybody. I love the people that I've worked with. I, I've always loved them. They shaped so much of not just my personal life or my professional life, but just me as a being. Mm. You know, you grow up with them. You're six years old. They have been basically my whole memory portion of my life they've been such huge impacts so they're always going to be important do you think that if Roseanne Barr ever publicly turned over at New Leaf they would ever consider bringing her back even for like a flashback or something like that listen there's always room there's always the potential and I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things she's brilliant she's always been brilliant um she's a brilliant storyteller and, and I, I think that there are lots of ways for her you know i have some ideas for things that i think she could do but she she's incredibly talented and she's working and she's doing stuff and you know she doesn't need to work she's working because she loves what she does and so i'm always interested to see what she comes up with next and what she does you know i, I think there's there's so much more inside her mm. and as she ages the stories change right being yeah. a grandma now being in a different role you know, what becomes of that, that, that's to the powers to be. I never tell people how to run their show. I don't want people to do the same to me at some point. So <laughs> here's a question I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connor show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you, something we may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that? Well, I don't have a lot of like, you know, human tricks or whatever. I, I missed that part of regular school. Um, <laughs> so I didn't learn all the weird things my body can do. or I can't wiggle my ears or any of that. I have a lot of unique skills. Um, one of the things I think my great strength is I have a real deep connection and, and authenticity. I just, I'm very open about who I am. Kind of a specialist in grief. I used to do some grief counseling. Um, I was a rescue diver for 10 years. So, you know, kind of prone to be the guy who jumps in to go help people. Uh, I w I've had a lot of weird jobs. I've worked a lot of blue collar jobs outside of entertainment to feed a family and take care of stuff. I was a coach for 25 years. Um, I was a bounty hunter for like five years. So wow. uh, I have a lot of tactical training, which I think people don't realize. So, <laughs> you know, I, uh, 
I was a carpenter, built a lot of stuff, did a lot of construction. So I'm a, I'm a real unusual individual, but in the best, uh, hopefully most supportive way. So you're kind of like a Swiss army person. You can do pretty much everything. Uh, I pretty much am. I was, I was required <laughs> to learn a lot of skills and, and my goal now is to pass them on and, and what it's done for me actually it makes it really beautiful when I start telling stories because I have a lot of different perspectives and a lot of areas of my life to pull from. And I know what it's like to, to work 14, 15 hours at a crazy job. I know what it's yeah. like to work construction and be the underdog. I know what it's like to be the coach and have to guide young people. Right. So there's a lot of depth there, you know, and, and it's been a beautiful blessing. You know, I, I might not have always signed up for those things if I had known ahead of time, <laughs> but right. they all taught me beautiful things. But you've experienced a lot of life, which is good. Yes, uh, I, I am. I am literally squeezing every ounce of life out of this body that I can. That's the spirit. I think you have to, right? Yes. You know, and I, I try really hard to be a support structure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of try to be a lighthouse in the dark. You know, I, li I like to be the place that when people are struggling, that they can come. And so... Um, where a lot of other people get worn down by that. I kind of am empowered by it and then people matter to me. Sometimes you go live on Instagram. Yeah. I, I like just listening to you interact with fans and just telling stories about your day or inspiring people or giving advice and stuff like that. I try to be open. I, I think mm -hmm. what we do is unique. Um, social media has created this thing. I think a lot of people create personas and it's just their highlight reel. And I think that's really dangerous for a lot of, especially for young people. And a lot of people are struggling with mental health, um, you know, particularly, you know, when I lost my son and. So sorry to hear that, by the way. Yeah. And, and I didn't know how to handle that. And normally I would, uh, you know, I spent so many years being so private. Yeah. Um, but I talked to his sister and, and really asked her because people started asking me about it. And she said, you know, if you can share his story and if we can help one other family not experience that. And that really shifted me and opened me in certain ways. And that led to me doing a lot of lives and a lot of um, really <laughs> dangerously candid and open conversations that I think, you know, representatives got really nervous about. Yeah. But it was really important because people came on and shared their stories. And the thing people need to realize is whether it be in entertainment or just on a personal level, like you're not in it alone. Like the things you're facing, other people are facing too. And yeah. There is support. There is compassion. So don't give up more than anything, right? Don't punish yourself because you deserve for somebody to care and listen and, and matter. I 100% agree with that. People want you on this planet and there are a ton of people that have been through the same thing. And, you know, sometimes just sharing what you're going through, it means people can check in on you and just alleviate some of your burden, even if it's just grabbing something from a shop that you need or whatever it is. That just helps you get through these difficult times and losing anyone is the worst. And I lost my my dad in 2017, my mom in 2020, and I was basically a non-functional person for a long time. But you slowly find ways to get through your day and to have a reason to get out of bed. And you, it's still with you. I still carry that with me every single day. But, you know, they would want me to keep going on and just do my best in the time I'm granted on this planet. And if I can help other people along the way, too. And I think that's so powerful. Like, first, I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, Thank you. you know, it, it, it means a lot. And it brave and uh, appreciate you sharing because somebody at home is going to watch that moment and realize that they're not alone and that they're they're going through the same thing mm. and i think a big part of that is made it unpopular to be vulnerable right and unfortunately mm. a lot of times people are vulnerable and it's with the wrong person or people don't know how to react right so yeah. for some of us to make space for others to accept kind of the vulnerability that exists but what i'll tell you is I have a unique perspective because growing up working with adults, I lost a lot of coworkers. Yeah. You know, I lost coworkers. I lost friends. I lost family members. I've been to more funerals than I can count. And what it made me is kind of an expert in grief in some ways. And I you know even the experience with my son, I think it shifted me. And what I would tell you is I look at grief as a gift. And I know that sounds crazy to people, but it is, it is the love that you have that you cannot place somewhere in the current time. Mm. And, and the reality is the greater the love, the greater the grief. And so I, I tell people, 
I welcome mine every day. And sometimes there are moments that are really, really hard and I can't explain to people, but I welcome it because I would never have wanted to live a life without those people. Yeah. And I'm so thankful. I remember when my mom died, someone that I guess hadn't been through that just said, you know, you shouldn't be this upset, go speak to a counselor. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I should be this upset as my mom. And it's a process you have to go through. There are no wrong feelings when you're going through something like that. And every reaction is valid if you don't react straight away or if you react six months later or 10 years down the line, whenever it is, that's okay. And it's really hard, but you, you still carry these people with you. Their memories live on as long as you do. And I still remember random things that happened in like 1995. They're still part of your life. They yeah. echo through you and their reverberations, the same as I hope. My reverberations empower other people after I'm gone. Their mm. reverberations empower us. People have a hard time because I think sometimes it's hard for people to process other people's grief. I think yeah. the truth is like, look, grief comes in stages and it, it really, to me, comes in waves, right? And you yeah. don't know when the big wave's going to come and hit you and knock you down. And it happens. And some of it yeah. is you just have to own it. And, and that's part of love, right? Like, Anybody who's ever really loved somebody knows that anytime there's absence, there's going to be pain because that's a combination. But there's also a beauty in that if you're willing. Mm. Yeah, because grief is love enduring, isn't it? It is. And, and it is the continual expression of love. Mm. And regardless, I, you know, I never push spirituality on people. I think people can have whatever beliefs, but regardless of what your belief system is, you can still share that love yeah universally you can share that love you can speak to those people you can pass on their memory and pass on the parts of them that you wish other people got to know or experience and the best of them can become a big part of you i'm gonna talk about all the other stuff that you produce in a bit as well but i'll just say go and seek out all of michael's content that he puts online it's really important conversations and we will get to that but yeah thank you for doing that and just using your voice and your platform to help people heal a little bit. Yeah, I want to be a safe place. Um, there's enough people who, you know, I get a lot of hate online, <laughs> have for years and years, you know. Yeah. I grew up with bomb scares and death threats and stuff following the national anthem. So my perspective on it, I guess, is probably different than a lot of other people. Yeah. I saw the best and a lot of times I saw some of the worst in people. But it also gave me this beautiful perspective of just how beautiful people can be and that a little mm. bit of kindness goes a long way. Really does. So changing the topic completely now, you recently starred in Abducted by My Teacher, the Elizabeth Thomas story. You played Tad Cummins. It's based on a true story. I've yeah. not seen the movie yet, but I've seen the trailer. It looks super creepy. What can you tell me about it? Uh, first, that was a really hard thing to say yes to. I actually said no yeah. initially. Um like I said, I was a bounty hunter for years. This is exactly the kind of person that I would have chosen to take the case to go put somebody away. I mean, yeah, that's definitely. the kind of people that I tracked down. So DJ is such a lovable character. I built that for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and you, DJ is so far removed from who I am. But the best parts of DJ, I think, come from me. This was a total departure. This was um, a really dark character. I think it's a really important story from the standpoint of, I think grooming is a big thing, especially now with online and, and the interaction that people are having. I think there's a lot more grooming going on. As the dad of two young women, I thought it was a really important story. So my initial response was like, oh God, no, and ew. And then I, you know, I really actually, I talked to both my daughters um, and I sent them the script. Uh, we made some adjustments, you know, uh, Sean, who was the director, was wonderful and, and Juliet who kind of ran it, but uh, Elizabeth Smart was also attached. So you had somebody with personal experience yeah. to help shape this story. So I, I started to feel slightly more comfortable. And then it's like, man, this is a big challenge. And like, you know, being at the top of a call sheet, right? Being at, being the lead and, and getting to, you know, Summer and I are kind of co-leads in this thing. She's a beautiful young actress who is so talented. You know, she's like 20 years old, but looks 14. So some of those, some of those scenes, I, you know, I have to say things that whew, make my skin crawl even. And there were moments where the crew would be like, are you okay? And I was like, no, but that's a good thing. 
because that's part of who I am. But the ability to transform yourself, I mean, you want to talk about a challenge, like to be able to to step into that and to be impactful and to play all the different levels. And we really tried to dive into the psychological part of, of this guy who is kind of a manipulative liar who, who makes his own, his own backstory and shapes things and kind of shifts who he is and kind of plays everybody around him and fools everyone essentially and then runs off with this young girl. It was a lot. And then also for me, I love the opportunity to set the tone on set for how we're going to treat each other, how we're going to be professional, how we were going to, you know, interact. And, you know, like I said before, I love my crew and I love being able to connect with people. But I also know that sometimes there's hierarchies and stuff. So to kind of let people be a lot more comfortable and empower people across all levels, that was such a beautiful opportunity. You know, it, it's nice when you get seven, eight, nine pages where it's mostly your dialogue and like, you want to do this at the highest level. Here's your challenge. And we shot it all in like 15 days to try and beat the strikes. Crazy hours. And I'm in Canada and you're on the road. And like, it, it was every challenge you could take all at once and play a character that is so far away from who you are as a being. Like, you know, I've just talked to you about compassion and kindness and supporting people, loving people. And then I played this kind of a monster of an individual. And it's a beautiful challenge and the feedback was really great. And there were lots of times <laughs> it sounds horrible, but like as an actor, like there's a scene and I say something to, um, I say something to Summer, who's Elizabeth Thomas in this thing. And you know, you're doing good work and all of a sudden it's so quiet. Right. And, and you, the scene finishes and it just kind of plays. And then all of a sudden you hear somebody, you know, the director, Sean Gale's cut and a whole bunch of people go, oh, like, like there's this audible disgust. Yeah. And there's a moment where you're like, man, I did good work. And you're like, Oof, that's a little gross. But at the same time, that's the nature of acting. Like you have to be willing to play some roles that make you uncomfortable that you're willing to get outside yourself for. Mm. You also played Antonelli in a sports comedy and drafted also based on a true story. Mm -hmm. and, and I was the pitcher for the other team. I was basically the bad guy pitcher. Um, and I, you know, I was, a, I was a baseball player and a coach, so I loved it. And I got to throw all day, everything, but it's funny cause they made, made me slow down. So there's times like the coach and he's like, man, you don't look nearly as athletic as you should there, buddy. But, <laughs> you know, cause you know, I had to throw easier so people could hit the ball and like, but what a beautiful, again, as a baseball player, as that being one of your dreams growing up to get to do that in a film. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of baseball films to begin with. So I've always, it was on my bucket list. So I got to check something else off. You have just launched the Lovesick podcast with Dorothea McGuire and Jada Ford. They're a mother and daughter combo. Can you tell us about how it first came about? I know you talk about chronic illness and health and wellness and just loving sick people. I've had a listen to it. It's really great conversations. Yeah, you know, Lovesick came about, it, it was kind of Jada's baby and her her idea jada and i had been friends jada came on my other podcast which is fish's call sheet where i celebrate people who work in the industry i try to celebrate the people behind the scenes who don't get the credit and kind of tell their journey and their story which i'm still doing kind of revamping love sick is about loving people who are sick the journey of being sick and, and kind of the love that goes with dealing with illness and wellness and, and kind of everything involved mental health so each episode we dive into somebody's story but they also kind of take us into their world but also the way that they've dealt with either a chronic illness or a personal story you know and we have these deep conversations you know to have a mother and daughter team to get their perspective you know you kind of get multiple generations and you get very different perspectives you get male female you get different ages you get people who are living with chronic illnesses so for a lot of people we want to open a discussion because in a lot of places, especially rare diseases, there's not really a community and people feel alone. And so they don't always get the care and the help and the support they need. So again, this is an opportunity to kind of maybe shine the light a little and help people kind of feel safe and, and connect and build a community where people can talk and kind of share information and provide each other resources for how to be healthier, how to empower themselves in a holistic, in a natural way, in, in different forms of medicine and have an idea of what to ask their doctors. So it's this goal of kind of creating a place where people can learn, but also interact and connect. 
I really highly recommend the podcast and it's great for just getting life advice for yourself and how to better support other people. If you hear about something that you haven't learned about before, then your friend's going through it. It enables you to better support them. It's exciting. I mean, we're a couple ahead and, you know, I'm reaching out to people all the time. So if anybody has a great story or, or wants to share their journey, their health journey, or even the things they do to stay healthy, right? Come be a part of it. Be a part of our community. If I ever work out any ways to stay healthy, I'll be on that. I'm basically the before photo at the moment. So give oh, me come a while. <laughs> come on. Uh, somebody as kind as you are who works as hard to take kind of a real detailed look into people's lives. There's a lot of kindness and compassion there. There's a lot of healthy parts of that. Well, thank you very much. I just love doing it and celebrating people. So can you tell me what you're working on next? Obviously your your podcast and all that other good stuff. Anything else you might have in the pipeline? Well, the podcast was a great thing to do during the strike and kind of kind of launch that area. I'm still doing Fisher's Call Sheet where I celebrate people who work on the crew and work behind the scenes. And then I have a bunch of pilots and a bunch of shows that I'm out pitching and a bunch of movies. So I have a couple of comedies. I have two sitcoms. I have one military based. I have one that kind of is behind the entertainment industry. And then I have some more I'm working with somebody on a caregiver one. And, and there's some other projects. I have a Western you know, some dramas. And then I have a huge, um, I have to be careful how much I say in front of the whole world, right? Well, um, tell anybody, it's fine. It, you're right. It's a, it's a government agency that's never been used. That It's kind of a serialized drama that kind of taps into some of my tactical and, and you know, my other background. And so there's all these different projects. Uh, I'm also working on a medical show um, from a unique perspective. So it's a ton of stuff. You know, I, I love to work. And for me, it's about telling a good story. It's not really about writing stuff necessarily for me. It's about writing stuff that compels me and from perspectives that you, you mm -hmm. don't hear a lot of. So the goal is, you know, to spend the next 40, 45 years making incredible productions that people can connect with. I know that you will. And I wish you the very best of luck with all of that. I know it's all going to be amazing and I can't wait to watch all of it. Oh, I deeply appreciate that. Even if some of it's not available in the UK and I have to go back over to the US again to watch things. Well, you're always welcome to come out this way. But here's what I'll tell you. If you see something that I did that you want, I will well, at least sneak you a little something if you like. Oh, really? Know. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll probably do that quite a lot then. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so have you got any advice for anybody that wants to get into acting or filmmaking? Yeah, I would tell you, make stuff. If you want to be in this business, gone are the days where you have to spend a ton of money and you know cameras used to be hard to get and the and the, the resources were almost impossible once upon a time when i started out now people are making movies on their phones and what i would tell you is if you have a good idea find like-minded people build your community because really this business at its best is a bunch of community oriented people building together so and be willing to do the stuff the dirty work that it takes right but Try to do it with some honor and some care because all those people as you go up, the people that you either help rise with or that you step on on your way up are either going to keep you up when you get there or they're going to help bring you back down if you kind of use them on the way up. So I would tell you, be conscious of it. And then the other part is characters can have a persona, but you really should try to be as authentic as you can. Dive into the things that you know, connect with people and don't. Don't lie about your background or who you are, because the reality is the world is too small. Everyone's going to figure it out. So your superpower is being you. Your superpower is not trying to be somebody else. That's really good advice. Thank you. So looking back on everything that you've worked on and achieved, can you tell me what you're the most proud of? Oh, I think what I'm most proud of, I think maybe is maybe behind the scenes. And it's probably not the thing, you know. I've worked on some of the most iconic stuff. I've been incredibly blessed, but at the same time, I think it's how I made people feel because you mentioned it before, you know, I have this reputation of being really kind and being really caring and being giving and being open. And that's not always easy to do. And I've really cultivated my kind of authentic giving openness. Uh, I love people and I've really decided to love in a very open way. And I'm getting even better at that as I age and grow. Um, and loss taught me some of that too. So I would say I think the thing I'm most proud of is that I love people openly and authentically and that I really care about the people along the way and I help people. 
And I'm really proud of the kids that I, I kind of have put into the world and that I've helped grow along the journey. And so my final question, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Uh, for anybody watching the Sarah O'Connell show, my last message to you would be live bravely. Part of love means that there's going to be some pain. People will come, people will go. Love openly and don't miss the opportunity to share how much you care. Because life is super short. And then go make the beautiful things you want to see in the world. I'm here to make art and to create things, but I'm really here to highlight people and to share a voice. And I appreciate anybody who comes along that journey. You can reach out to me anytime. But great people help great people. So, Sarah, thanks for having me. Michael Fishman, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honor to chat to you and to celebrate not only your career, but just the amazing work and love you put out into the world. So thank you for that. My pleasure. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of The Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Hey, I'm Michael Fishman. Subscribe to The Sarah O'Connell Show. You'll never believe the things we're going to talk about, and she always dives into the most important parts of people's history.